today as we come to the table. Here's my heart. Listen, we have to learn the lesson that Jacob learned here, and that is this. Just because something looks wonderful doesn't mean it's God, and we need to fall on our face before Him and make sure that it's God. Because many believers have believed it was the Lord throughout history and have gone a wrong direction because of it. And I think sometimes even the enemy dangles a carrot out there in front of us. I, you know what? The enemy would love to give you a $20,000 a year raise if he could get you to turn your back on God because you're too busy. He's not dumb. He'll let you enjoy temporary stuff down here to pull away eternity from you and to rip off your eternal reward. He's very wise. He's very smart. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's too good to be true? While this is not necessarily a motto to live by, as Christ followers, we can be reminded to filter all things through our leading by the Holy Spirit. When Jacob was presented with a wonderful offer in Genesis 46, he first made sure it was of the Lord. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark will encourage listeners to routinely filter their lives through God's will. The enemy wants to distract and lure believers away from the Lord. Blessing does come with a life following after God, but it's still important to remain in tune with the Holy Spirit so that you know it's Him. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 45 as he continues his message, The Gathering of the Nation of Israel. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. I wonder if they rode in the carts, you know, and on the way back and propped their feet up and hooked their donkeys to pull them. And this is the life. Now, for us, we think, yeah, come on. They're traveling across the desert in carts. Try walking across the desert, you know, or riding a donkey across the desert. You'd be thankful for this cart. It'd be great. You could put some padding down, enjoy yourself, you know, and no doubt they're just, just having a big time. Uh, you know, it's just, I love to see how God does these special things and just, God just wanted to bless them and God wanted to bless, he wants to bless us. And so we just start, you know, just, they head up there, they got their carts and notice it doesn't stop there. It says, then the sons of Israel did so. They took the carts and went up according to the command of Pharaoh and he gave them provisions for the journey, verse 22. And he gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. You know, a little bit of favoritism going on here. But on behalf of Benjamin, let me say, I think this was some back pay that Joseph was giving him because his brothers had ripped Benjamin off of all those years of having his brother. And I think it was kind of like, you know what? I'm going to bless you extra special because you've missed out on a lot. You know, a lot of people accuse God of being unjust. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, God said, go to your neighbors and ask them for silver and gold and I'll make them give it to you. So God moved in the people's hearts. They went next door and left and right, and they gave them silver and gold. And people say, well, that's not fair of God. He made them go and just take their things. That's not right. Wait a minute. They'd been serving as slaves for free for hundreds of years for the nation of Egypt. And they would not have been in the homes they'd been in had it not been for the Jews. They would not have had the things they would have had. And I think maybe for Benjamin here, there was a little bit of back pay, but also probably a little bit more testing, you know, from uh, Joseph to find out, are you guys going to get jealous? And what I love about this, there's no jealousy mentioned. Isn't this great? They were just happy to receive what they had. And you know what? It's going to be like that in the kingdom because the Bible says that we're going to get different amounts of rewards up there. Now, first of all, let me say this. If we get different amounts of reward, wouldn't there be hard feelings? No, because there's not going to be jealousy. There's not going to be competition. But here's why we get different amounts of rewards. Note this. We're getting different amounts of rewards based on our faithfulness down here. You know, guys, this life is so short. I don't want to motivate you to try to get the best, you know, whatever uh, in, in, in heaven. That's not the goal here. But listen, this life is so short and we have such a short amount of time and depending on how faithful we are with what God has given us. Well, Pastor Mark, God hasn't given me hardly anything. Okay, what has he given you? Well, you know, this one, you know, this stick. Okay, use that stick for the glory of God. With a stick, Moses split the Red Sea. But it was under the power of God's hand that he did it. 
So you say, God, what have you put in my hand? What do I have? I don't know. Then take it and use it. And here's the key. It's not a matter of how much more gifting somebody else has than you. It's what have you done with what you have that will determine your reward. And Benjamin here, no doubt, had been faithful to his dad. No doubt had been, had, had, you know, we don't know the story behind that. But now I believe God rewarding Benjamin through Joseph in the midst of this. And he's giving him all these, uh, you know, uh, extra things. But now note this as well about this. I find it interesting because as we look at Joseph as a type of Jesus Christ, notice here what they did to Joseph. They, they, they stripped him of his clothes, his coat of many colors. They sold him and betrayed him and turned away from him and rejected him. And notice what he did. He clothed them in new clothing, new raiments. He blessed them and gave them gifts. How like Jesus Christ is that? We rejected him, turned away, rebelled against him sold him as a slave, literally, or rather sold him for the price of a slave. Judas did, and the nation of Israel. And we did it before we came to Christ by living in sin, turning away from him. We turned away. And what does he do? The Bible says when we receive him now as our Lord and ask forgiveness, he gives us robes of righteousness, new clothing. All the old passes away. All the old becomes new. God gives it all to us afresh. So there's a beautiful picture here of what the Lord is doing, even in giving the change of garments. And notice he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and food for his father and for the journey. So giving them everything they need, but also giving them just, you know, extra special things. And so he sent his brothers away. And I love this. And they departed and he said to them, and I I have to just kind of laugh. He said, see that you do not become troubled along the way. You know, I've seen you guys your whole life. Yeah, I missed you for 17 years, but I saw you the first 17. And all you did was fight and cause trouble for dad. And then you got mad at me and sold me into slavery. And since you've been back, I've been watching you fight when you didn't know I understood what you were saying and argue and said, just get along. You know, enjoy, just enjoy this. Don't fight. And I understand that encouragement, especially from a dad's viewpoint, because, you know, sometimes you see your kids and you're like, come on, guys, just get along. Just love each other, but let's go beyond just our own kids in the body of Christ. You know, God has so blessed us, hasn't he? And I think that we need to look at each other and say, let's just get along, love each other. Yeah, we're going to rub shoulders ever so often. We're going to hurt each other's feelings. Get it right. Ask forgiveness and just love, love each other. Love covers a multitude of sins. And so, again, he says to him, you know what? Just get along. Don't argue. And then they went up out of Egypt and they came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. Now the scene changes. You know, you see him, the whole thing, the excitement in Egypt, the traveling in the limos across the desert, and all of a sudden all these limos pull up in front of dad's tent. And they've got this great story that they're going to tell dad. And you can imagine the excitement building here. I wonder who's running in. You know, I'm going to tell him first or whatever. And so they told him saying, Joseph is still alive and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. I don't know how they said it, but I imagine just kind of Jacob just freezing. Because notice it says here in the rest of the verse, and Jacob's heart stood still. Again, the word means went numb, literally in the language. He's alive. He went numb. And notice it says this, because he didn't believe them. Now, I understand that when it comes to his sons. But again, what a picture of Jesus Christ this is. Remember when they, when they ran back and announced the women who saw that he'd risen, they came, they said, he's alive. What did the disciples do? What did the followers of the Lord do? They didn't believe. They needed further evidence to believe. And what we're going to see is as soon as he looks out the tent, he sees, you know, the, 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 the carts, you know, the, the limos, so to speak, and all the supplies. Then he believes when he sees all that. But it reminds me of what Jesus said. You know, first of all, it reminds me of the story when Jesus came, how the disciples didn't believe. And again, we see the picture further played out in greater detail. But it also reminds me of where Jesus said, you know, your eyes have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And see, that's us today. We haven't seen the Lord bodily and yet we believe. And so again, here, there's whole picture being played out of even the way it was with the disciples. Hey, Thomas went so far, he said, you know what? Unless I put my fingers in his wounds, I'm not going to believe. It'd be like saying, unless I go out there and sit in the limo, you know, where'd you guys steal this thing? And so Jacob here again, he knows what's going to happen. It says, but when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father revived. And again, notice this, he didn't believe until he saw the evidence. And that's what really spurred him on now to believe. But now he goes, this is, there's no way you guys could have gotten these carts. There's no way you could have all these supplies. It's true, Joseph is really alive. And again, it reminds me of the excitement they must have had when the Lord entered the room and said, peace be to you, I'm alive. And I think about the disciples and the excitement that they had. I mean, can you imagine when he died, the two men on Emmaus Road? They're walking with their heads down. They're all sad. We thought he was going to be a savior. We thought this was the one, and now it's all that. And now all of a sudden, they're on top of the world. It's true. And see, that's how we should be realizing he's alive. 
And we go and we get to share this good news that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and eternity is real and the Lord is coming back. And so there's a, a level of excitement here, even in the picture that's being portrayed out. So it says, so Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father. Notice Israel. Remember we said that when Jacob was in his flesh, the Lord called him Jacob, which was his earthly name, which by the way means heel catcher, or we would say deceptive person. Israel is the new name God gave him when he was walking in the spirit, and it's the name that means prince with God or governed by God. How many of us go back and forth between Jacob and Israel in our life? Well, Israel's in a good place. He now sees that God has done an amazing work. He's believing that the Lord has done a miracle. He's not doubting anymore. Remember right before this, he said, all things are against me. That was Jacob. Now we see Israel saying, God, you've done it. And he goes to offer a sacrifice. And no doubt it was a sacrifice of thanksgiving, a sacrifice of praise that he was giving simply out of gratitude. But I think there's more going on here because again, notice this, before he takes off and really does this journey, he offers God a sacrifice. I think not just for thanksgiving, but also to make sure that it was God. Remember when Abraham went down there, he thought it was God, didn't he? No doubt he did, but it wasn't God. And he got in a lot of trouble and he got his family in a lot of trouble. Later on, Isaac tried to go down there. God intervened and said, don't go down there. I don't want you down there. It's going to be a big mistake. Now, this time God's going to ordain it. I'm going to protect you down there. I'm going to keep you separate from the Egyptians in the land of Goshen. They'll live here. You'll live there. And I've got a plan in doing this. I'm going to build a nation when I do this. But, but again, God being the one in control here and saying, this is something that, that I'm going to do. But you know what? You need to, here's the lesson for us, see. Here's what Israel had learned. And that is, even when it looks like God, I need to pray and make sure. That's a lesson that we need to learn as believers. Sometimes you see things that look like no-brainers. We need to get before the Lord and offer a sacrifice. You're not literally an animal. You know that. But fall on our knees before the Lord and say, God, is this something? I mean, it sure looks like you. But Lord, is it really you? Well, God, it's got to be you. It's a $20,000 a year raise. This has got to be you. This is God. I'm not even, this is not, it's a no-brainer. Let's go, right? Well, excuse me, what? Well, are you going to be able to be in fellowship anymore? Well, we'll know, but our family needs it. Are you going to ever be able to serve the Lord anymore? Well, no, I'll be too busy for that. But this has got to be God because we need the help. Well, do you think God would lead you into something, even though it looks good, that's going to lead you away from him? Okay, you had to bring that up, Pastor Mark. Why don't you just keep your opinions to yourself? It's a $20,000 raise for crying out loud. Here's my heart. Listen, we have to learn the lesson that Jacob learned here, and that is this. Just because something looks wonderful doesn't mean it's God, and we need to fall on our face before him and make sure that it's God. Because many believers have believed it was the Lord throughout history and have gone a wrong direction because of it. And I think sometimes even the enemy dangles a carrot out there in front of us. I, you know what? The enemy would love to give you a $20,000 a year raise if he could get you to turn your back on God because you're too busy. He's not done. He'll let you enjoy temporary stuff down here to pull away eternity from you and to rip off your eternal reward. He's very wise. He's very smart. And so again, I think this is very wise. He goes before the Lord he, and he falls down to find out, you know, hey, I don't want to make the same mistake that, that Abraham did and that, that Isaac did. So he goes to make a sacrifice. And I, and I love this because again, notice what this is when it comes to praise and worship, guys. And this is a great place to point out what is true praise and worship. I know it's worshiping God in spirit and truth, but this is going to come up again in this chapter before we're done. I know it's spirit and truth, but you know what br brings about true praise and worship? It's a natural response to the goodness of God. How many of you, when God has done something great in your life, had to say, no, this was the most fantastic thing in my life. Sometime tomorrow around two, I'm just going to set aside some time and thank him. You know what we do when it happens? We start praising him right then. And we say, God, you are so good. You have just blessed me beyond my wildest dream. I can't believe what you're doing in my life. Spontaneous. That's the best type of praise, realizing that. Now, why do I say that? Because when we come on Sunday morning to praise the Lord, or Sunday night, or Wednesday night, or whenever we gather together, or in your home, if you want it to truly be a sweet praise time, begin to meditate on how good he is and what he's done for you. Lord, you've blessed me so much. And then what happens? You begin to say, thank you, Lord. You know, you're so good that I give you praise and give you glory for what you've done. And so this spontaneous praise coming out. And notice then God spoke to Israel in visions of the night. And he said, now note this, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Now he just said he was Israel. Now he calls him Jacob. Not that he's necessarily jumped back in the flesh, but again, we're going to find out that even though God was working, he now has allowed fear to come in his heart. And guys, note this, fear in the heart of the believer, unless you're in sin, is not from God. And so now we see Jacob struggling a little bit again in the flesh because how do we know he was afraid? Notice he says, here I am. And God said, so he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. And don't be afraid. Don't doubt me. 
I'm doing this. My hand is in it. You did the right thing to seek me and make sure. But now that I'm confirming it, lose the fear, Jacob. Walk as Israel. Walk in the spirit. What does it say in 2 Timothy 1.7? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we realize when a spirit of fear comes upon us, it's not from God. It's from the enemy. Again, so we need to memorize that. And why is it so good to memorize that? And what did I want this person to know that and have it for? Because when the enemy attacks in that area, you can pull your sword out. Even as Jesus did in the wilderness, with every temptation, he said, it is written. And so she can now pull her sword out and say, it is written. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and a sound mind. And the Bible says it will mow the enemy down. That's our weapon, guys, the Word of God. And so whatever area it is you're struggling is memorizing the Word of God and knowing the Word of God and using it against the enemy, quoting the Word of God because God hadn't given us fear. Now God is saying to Jacob, hey, don't be afraid. That's not from me. It's just something I'm doing. It's a blessing. And so he no doubt probably had fear as well just because I think of you know, his, his age. I mean, it's hard when you're that well over 100 years old and traveling down to another country you know, to restart his life. He no doubt had great fears about this. And so, but he tells him the reason, you know, we're going to, I'm going to move you down there. I'm going to make your descendants a great nation down there. And again, he would have, of course, known the Abrahamic covenant where God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. So he would have been comforted by recognizing God's hand in it. And also that God's just fulfilling his word and the promise to Abraham. Notice verse four, I will go down with you. Yes, there you go to Egypt. And I will also surely bring you up again. How is that? When the children of Israel come out again, your descendants will come up. And Joseph will put his hands on your eyes. What a sweet verse. Why so? Because you see, that's when you, when you would die. Oftentimes when people die, their eyes remain open. And that's because the muscles have quit working. And so what they would do is they would, they would close the eyes. And he says, you know what? Not only are you going to get to see your son Joseph again, he's going to be there at your death. He's going to be there with you till the very end. He's going to be the one that puts his hand on your eyes, Jacob. Wow. What a sweet blessing of the Lord. All these things that are now coming together and making this whole picture fall into place for for Jacob. Then Jacob rose from Beersheba and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives and their carts, which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan. And they went to Egypt and Jacob and all his descendants went with him and his sons and his son's sons, his daughters and his son's daughters and all the descendants that he brought with him to Egypt. And that lists all of them, which we're not gonna read every name that's in there. Notice verse 26. And all the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt who came from his body besides Jacob's son's wives were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. So that makes four because the two sons and and then of course Joseph and his wife. And all the persons of the house of Jacob who were in Egypt or went to Egypt were 70. So the total number amount and from 70 people we're gonna see that God builds a nation to over 2 million by the time they come out. Uh, some 400 years later. And so we're going to see God doing a great work with, you know, with them down there. And what I find interesting about this, notice this, God took them down there in Egypt, but he kept them separate over in Goshen. Note that, Christian. The Bible says that we have to live in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We as believers should be living in the land of Goshen. We should be living in the land of blessing from the Lord. That doesn't mean we don't associate with those in Egypt because we were in Egypt before we came to Christ. As you know, Egypt is a type of the world, but we're not to live with Egypt like Egypt. We live in Goshen, and we intermingle with the Egyptians to lead them to the Lord. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. We're going to see when the children of Israel finally do come out of Egypt, they take a lot of the Egyptians with them. They went in there and shared. They saw the God of Israel and what the God of Israel could do, and so therefore, they brought them out with them. Notice the last verse, and it said, Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. I find this interesting because Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And notice he sends Judah here before them to point them to the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And we've been pointed to the way in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, this coming through the line of Judah uh, to the land of Goshen. What is the land? The land of plenty, the land of blessing, the land of fatness in the Lord, so to speak, as the Bible would put it. And so we can enjoy the rich relationship that we have with the Lord now, and we can enjoy the rich relationship that we'll have with with the Lord in the kingdom forever. And so, again, we see today in this passage, as we finish up, guys, we see today a picture of the future, future gathering of the nation of Israel. We see the literal gathering of the Israel, the nation back together. We see a future picture of the nation gathered in the millennial kingdom, uh, but it's also, and also their eternal salvation. But it's not just for them, guys, it's for us. And the question for us today is this, are there any of, of us as Gentiles who don't yet know the God of Israel? 
Jesus is the way. He said, no one goes to the Father except by me. In Acts 4.12, it says, there's no other name under heaven and earth by which a man can be saved. And so we have to come through Jesus Christ. So the question for us today is this, have we entered the land of Goshen? Have we responded to the Lord's call and have we received the Lord? Make sure you choose that right path before you leave today. Pastor Mark, how do I do it? It's very simple. You simply confess that you're a sinner, that you believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and for your sins, and that he rose again the third day and is alive today, that he's coming back again, and you want to be a part of that kingdom. So say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I confess them to you. Wash them away and invite me into your family. I want to be in the land of Goshen. I want to be in the kingdom of God, and I want to be with you forever there. And the Bible says the Lord will grant you that. He will do it. But I also find this interesting, too, that Judah is the one that pointed them the way to the land of Goshen. Why do I say that? Judah literally means praise. And we talked about praise earlier. Praise is so important in our life. And I believe that one of the avenues for the Christian to have a joy-filled life and to be just rejoicing and thankful to the Lord is a regular praise life, a life of praise to God. And Judah leads the way. Praise leads the way to Goshen. And so as we finish today and as we worship the Lord today, let's worship Him with all of our heart. Let's pour out our heart. Let's remember what God has done for the nation of Israel, what God is going to do with the nation of Israel, what God has done with us, and what God is going to do with us. I know some of us go through very difficult times down here in this world and in this life. But understand this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this life is the lowest point of your entire eternal existence. This is rock bottom. You can't get any lower than where you are right now for the rest of eternity. And it only goes up from here. Is that not exciting or what? But it's so bad, Pastor Mark. It may be. And some of you are going to go through heart-wrenching trials. And some of you have already been through them. But the joy that we have is what's set before us. The rejoicing that we have is, is the fact that what Jesus Christ has laid out, the Bible says he endured the cross for the joy set before him. So we endure this life for the joy that's set before him. We not only endure it, we can have joy in the midst of it with the Lord. And that causes us to rejoice. You see, that should cause us in our hearts to praise the Lord. And that praise will lead us to the land of Goshen, that freshness, that life. Let's pray. Lord, refresh us this morning. God, we have so much to be thankful for. As we see your promises fulfilled to the nation of Israel, God, as we see, Lord, your promises fulfilled to us, as we see, Lord, just how good you are, it causes us to thank you and to praise you. And I pray that our praise would be a natural response, Lord, just to your goodness, as well as, Lord, I pray that it would be something that would just drive us that we might learn to rejoice in the spiritual land of Goshen as we give you praise, Lord, from our heart and give you glory. Lord, I pray if there's any that have not made that decision for you, that they would confess you as Lord and repent of their sins, that they might know you, God, and that they might walk with you. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it interesting that it only took a couple of chapters in after God created everything for mankind to find a way to rebel? This is human nature, isn't it? Throughout history, God has something great in mind, but people find loopholes and do things their own way, rebelling against God. Something that's striking in the book of Genesis is that God remains faithful even when mankind does not. God keeps his promises when it would be impossible for anyone else to do so. What an amazing God we serve. Pastor Mark has been working his way through the opening book of the Bible, and there's so much more to gain from it. Come to the Table is a radio ministry of Calvary Knoxville. If you're enjoying these teachings, head over to thewaymedia.net to hear more. Just click on the Come to the Table tab while you're there. If you have any questions or comments about today's message, We'd love to hear them. Just look for the questions and comments link. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love for you to drop in and see us. You can find service times and locations on thewaymedia.net. Scroll to the bottom of the page and find a link to Calvary Knoxville. We have several service times that could accommodate whatever type of schedule you have. We're so thankful that you've joined us today, listening to Pastor Mark's thoughts and insights on the book of Genesis. There's more to learn and appreciate from the beginning of the Bible on. So come next time, grab your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, 
and be ready to understand the great things God has for you to learn the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.